Hey there, Spark fans, Rob Reynolds here. Since the addition of our GNSS timing breakout to our lineup of global positioning boards, I've been thinking more about timing and how it relates to GPS and global positioning satellites. Now, it turns out the clocks in those satellites are responsible for way more than just letting you know how many minutes away your Uber is. And while it's a subject that's way too deep for me to touch on in a single video, I want to scratch the surface a little bit. So let's take a look at GNSS timing and how it pertains to terrestrial positioning, spaceflight, and a few other important things, and talk about just how insanely accurate those clocks have to be every nanosecond of every day. So let's talk about GNSS timing. Uh, global positioning satellites allow us to determine location by using a combination of time and distance. Uh, by sending a signal from point A to point B, as long as we know the constant speed of that signal allows us to determine the distance. Now, by receiving signals from multiple transmitters, we can determine precise location. Of course, that relies on precise timing. And most modern clocks for precise timing rely on a quartz crystal oscillator. Uh, this works because we know that when we apply a voltage to a quartz crystal, it oscillates at a very specific frequency. Think of it like a pendulum on a tiny, tiny, tiny grandfather clock. And while this is very precise, it's not necessarily as stable as we need for some scientific measurements for, say, space navigation or even subaquatic navigation. A quartz crystal's oscillation can waver one direction or the other by up to a nanosecond after only an hour. Okay, so that's one billionth of a second over the course of an hour, and for most of us, it's really not going to negatively impact our lives. But by the end of six weeks, that variance can be as much as a full millisecond. And in space navigation terms, that translates to a distance error of 300 kilometers, or about 186 miles. Now, if you took a trip to Mars, and you know that takes anywhere from 150 to 300 days, keeping in mind that this variance is not linear but compound, uh, this instability becomes a huge issue. You could be off by millions of miles by the time you get to where you think Mars should be. Now I know only a very few of us will be building time-based projects headed out to other planets. Yes, I'm looking at you, Tim Canham. But timing issues can have catastrophic consequences down here on Earth as well. For global positioning systems to work, all of the satellites have to be accurate to within a billionth of a second. And since the signals that they send and receive travel at the speed of light, a timing error of just one microsecond, that's one millionth of a second from a satellite, converts to a distance error on Earth of 300 meters, or just about 1,000 feet. Enter the atomic clock. Now, atomic clocks still use a quartz crystal oscillator, but they combine that with the measured oscillation of electrons in atoms of certain elements. Now, by hitting those atoms with energy in the form of microwaves or lasers, we're able to excite that atom to the point where we can get an electron to jump from one energy shell to the next. Or more simply, we can get that atom to change energy states. And now the frequency is different for each element on the periodic table. But for every atom of a single element throughout the universe, that frequency is going to be exactly the same. Those atoms are going to react exactly the same to that energy. So if I were to build a cesium atomic clock up here at altitude in the Rocky Mountains, like they have right down the street at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and someone else were to build the cesium atomic clock in the Dead Sea, a thousand feet below sea level, and still someone else would build a cesium atomic clock into a satellite and send it out into space, all three of those clocks are going to act exactly the same because no matter where they are, those cesium atoms are going to react exactly the same. In fact, those oscillations are the literal definition of time. Uh, in scientific terms, a second is defined as 9,192,631,770 oscillations of the electrons of a cesium-133 atom. Whew. But even though cesium is the standard and has been since 1967, it's not the only element that can be used in atomic clocks. NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock, launched in 2019, uses mercury atoms, and that clock will be off by less than a nanosecond after four days, and less than a microsecond, or one millionth of a second, after 10 years. Now, if we want to talk long-term, we're looking at a clock that will be off by only one second every 10 million years. And while the idea of the deep space atomic clock being accurate to within a second either way after 10 million years seems impressive, it's nothing compared to the most accurate atomic clocks we have here on Earth. Uh, that clock I mentioned over in Boulder, the NIST F1 cesium clock, that produces a frequency so precise that its time error per day is about 0.03 nanoseconds, which means that the clock will gain or lose no more than a second over the course of the next 100 million years. Now let's look at this in another way, more in terms of precision. In the Olympics, runners are timed to within plus or minus 10 milliseconds. 
Usain Bolt, for example, ran the 100 meter in 9.58 seconds, you give or take 10 milliseconds. Now, if you've used the delay function when coding an Arduino, then you've worked in milliseconds, and you know that's pretty accurate. That gives you a thousand reference points per second. But the ZF9T can take that down to five nanoseconds. Now, let's compare that, shall we? Now, let's double that five to 10 nanoseconds just for easy math. So, if we start with our 10 milliseconds and divide it by 10, making it 10 times more accurate, we get 10 milliseconds divided by 10 is one millisecond. Now that 10 milliseconds divided by 100 is 100 microseconds. A 10 milliseconds divided by 1,000, that gives us 10 microseconds. Our 10 milliseconds divided by 10,000 takes us down to one microsecond. 10 milliseconds divided by 100,000 takes us down to 100 nanoseconds. And that 10 milliseconds divided by 1 million takes us down to 10 nanoseconds. So there's our 10 nanoseconds. Of course, since the ZF9T is capable of five nanosecond accuracy, that means this module can record at two million times the accuracy allowed in Olympic track events. Two million times more reference points than the 10 millisecond margin of error used in the Olympics. Now, if we space those reference points at the same distance as our millisecond reference points, that would be 9.58 seconds times two million, or 19,160,000 seconds. That means we'd be waiting 221 days, 16 hours to see Usain Bolt cross the finish line. Now, nanosecond accurate timing isn't just for global positioning or ridiculous attempts to make some kind of analogy to a sporting event. Things like data encryption, electronic signatures, time stamping, all of these require precision that's only available from atomic clocks. Also, bank encrypted exchanges, network syncing for power generation, as well as network syncing for broadcast, even stock trading all rely on that nanosecond accurate technology. And since the ZF9T can also be used as a control unit to transmit correction data, by using the differential timing mode, you can sync up multiple receivers, two, 20, whatever you need, to make incredibly accurate IoT projects. Hopefully this will get you thinking more about timing in upcoming projects, whether you're triggering 100 cameras for a bullet time effect in your next feature film, or trying to determine the direction of seismic activity. Uh, the accuracy of positioning and timing available to us right now is so incredibly precise, and we can't wait to see how you utilize it in upcoming projects. Until then, stay safe, be kind, and happy hacking. Enter the atomic clock. That's all, folks. Location by sending a signal, no, date of those atoms. What do I say next? Oh yeah, difference, same, difference, same. So let's talk about comic timing. I ain't got it. <laughs> In an, another way. <clears throat> Two sentences, can't get one. <laughs>